Hello. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome to the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I'm David Grant, the director of the California Health Interview Survey, and I'm very pleased today to welcome you all here to our Health Policy Research Seminar. Uh, today we have Dr. Mark Litwin speaking to us on uh, the un California's uninsured, uh, uninsured and prostate cancer. Um, I also would like to just apologize. Dr. Rick Brown had planned to be here today um, to introduce Mark and was uh, uh, delayed in Santa Monica, apparently. Um, Dr. Litwin is professor of health services and neurology. He teaches courses in healthcare delivery systems, medical outcomes research, quality of life assessment, and clinical urology. Dr. Litwin received his MD from uh, Emory University, his MPH from uh, UCLA, and trained in neurological surgery at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, he is presently working on demonstrating uh, differences in the cost efficiency in specialist versus generalist, creating quality of care report cards for California hospitals, and documenting the quality of men's lives and treatment after treatment for early and late stage prostate cancer. Please welcome me, or join me in welcoming Dr. Lipley. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. today is to um, spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, taking you on a bit of a journey um, that some people in the room have been on with me, since I uh, brought a bit of an entourage today from, from uh, up on South Campus, um, and, and hopefully giving you kind of some insights into the intersection between health policy and health politics and health research. Uh, healthcare uh, policy research, hopefully topics that are that are near and dear to the hearts of many people who come to um, presentations um, here. And so I'm going to sort of tell you a bit of uh, history of how this program that, that, uh, that's that been going on for a number of years got started, um, tell you a little bit about how we put it together, and then um, share with you a little bit of the research, the, the policy relevant research that has come out of the program um, from our various uh, research efforts over the last uh, several several years. Um, <clears throat> when I was uh, taking my MPH at UCLA in the early 1990s, they had back at the time, I don't know if they still have it, like a final comp, a comp exam where they gave you like, you know, discussion questions and you had to and you had to um, you had to fill like a blue book of you know with your answer. And one of the questions that we had, ironically, when I got my uh, competence in 1993 in the Department of Health Services in the school, was something. It read something like this: If you had a hundred million dollars to start a healthcare delivery program in a particular disease for a particular population, talk about how you would do it. And you could pick the disease, pick the population, and you just had to fill the blue book with with an answer. And it kind of ended up being sort of ironic foreshadowing, as my 10-year-old would say, as to um, how things kind of ended up, ended up playing out. Um, <clears throat> so with that as a bit of a teaser, let me, uh, let me give you some um, background on kind of how we got to the point of starting this program that we call IMPACT. Uh, some of this data, data is from Kaiser Family Foundation's website. Their website is listed up here. If you don't know the website, it's a really, really terrific website. They have great slide sets that you can just download for free and, and, and incorporate. They have these maps like this. It's really terrific. Um, the the, the, uh, ex the executive director of the Kaiser Family Foundation was here on campus last week speaking. You may have gone to her, her talk, and she showed all of her slides were from their website. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, as is not a surprise to anybody interested in, in um, health policy research in California, there is a tremendous amount of, of uh, lack of insurance um, in this country. And if you look at the Kaiser Family Foundation data, um, you can see, this is from data from um, 0809, the number of uninsured, uninsured adults um, is staggering. And of course, that's what prompted you know, a lot of the advances in healthcare reform that we've been fortunate enough to see in the last year. In California, it's estimated by the Kaiser Family Foundation that almost half of low-income adults are uninsured. If you look at the non-elderly uninsured, right, because once people become elderly, they most, for the most part, are eligible for Medicare. So if you look at the non-elderly uninsured, you see what the, what the um, breakdown is in terms of racial, et, race and ethnicity. 
in that um, Hispanics, particularly in California, bear a disproportionate burden uh, for being uninsured. But it cuts across all um, race, ethnicity, uh, race ethnicities. Um, <clears throat> this data, the California Healthcare Foundation also has some great slides on their website if you're putting together a, a talk like this. But if you break it down by family income and you look particularly at the sort of the bars on the left of the slide, those families that, that make um, under 50000 particularly under $25,000, are very likely to be uninsured, um, not, su not surprisingly. If you break it down by county in California, um, and, and you can sort of look through here and pick the, pick the uh, is that your slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so if you look through here, I kind of re I rearranged the way the table looks to make it all fit on one slide. But, uh, <laughs> but you, you can pick the county that you want to look that you want to look at, and um, I get great slides from your guys' website as well, obviously, um, particularly the uh, the color map of uh, of uh, California I like. But in, in any in any event, you, you can see these numbers. There is no three percent or seven percent or two percent. You know, the, the best one is you know nineteen percent, fifteen percent, twenty percent. And so um, across all the different counties, the 58 counties of California, there's a significant number of uninsured, particularly those who are low income. Well, if you marry that problem with the problem of prostate cancer, which is not a trivial disease in terms of incidence and prevalence across California and across the country, the United States in general, um, you can see where these two uh, problems are kind of on a, on a collision course to create a real crisis. Um, the rates of prostate cancer are significant, and they vary by racial group, and hence, because of the demographics of California and the California's counties, they tend to vary by county. Um, and so, for example, if you look in the East Bay up in San Francisco, in Contra Costa and Alameda, which traditionally have a much higher proportion of African American um, residents, you see higher rates of prostate cancer. And you can see here where the, so the dark orange um, 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 counties are, where prostate cancer is, is the worst. But it represents about a third of new cancer cases across the country and across California, being a microcosm for the country. So that's a lot of prostate cancer. Fortunately, prostate cancer very often is a disease that's indolent and low grade and doesn't tend to cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. But unfortunately, prostate cancer, as I'll show you in a little bit, prostate cancer in the low income, low income uninsured tends to behave more aggressively for a variety of probably biologic and sociologic uh, reasons. So with those two things as background, um, <clears throat> like so much in, in medicine and in science, um, it all ultimately comes down to serendipity. Um, <clears throat> and back during the Gray Davis administration, which seems like eons ago, <clears throat> there was a Secretary of Health and Human Services who was African American, uh, an African American prostate cancer survivor. And he got a B in his bonnet about the fact that we spend in this state about a bazillion dollars on women's health, no offense, for breast and cervical cancer, early detection and treatment, and at the time, zero dollars on prostate cancer. And so he decided that we needed to have more attention to quote unquote men's health or men's cancers. And so um, there was a $50 million uh, line item that was put into the governor's budget in, in, the, uh, in, in that fiscal year for the management of low-income, uninsured men with prostate cancer throughout California. So this was this is what they call an incoming call. In other words, this was not something that anyone applied for. Um, this is not something that anybody sought out. It was it, it emanated from the from the uh, the executive branch. And it got adopted into the budget. This, of course, was a very different time fiscally than we have now. They don't not throwing around. $50 million tickets, you know, to, to things these days, but it was a different time. And so a letter went out from the Department of Public Health, what was then called the Department of Health Services um, in Sacramento, to the chair, uh, the chair's offices of the, of the clinical departments at the uh, five UC medical centers that might have some interest in prostate cancer. And one of those letters went to my boss, Sean DeKernian, um, who um, has been the chair of urology here for about... Uh, 86 years now, 87 years, and he, he uh, didn't really know much about, about public health or about health services research, but he had someone on his faculty, myself, who did, and so he literally walked out of his office with this letter in his hand, and he walked down to my office, which was two doors down, and he handed it to me, and he said, could you do something with $50 million? <laughs> There's only one correct answer to that question. <laughs> Sure. Um, <laughs> what is it that I have to do? 
Um, I, I, I at, the, at the time, was a few years out from fellowship training and was trying to create a research enterprise in health services research and hadn't really thought much about, about running a public health program. Um, but, you know, if you, if, you, if you offer the money, they will come. And so, and so that's how it all basically started. So I followed up with a phone call back to the, the entity in Sacramento that had generated this interest and said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not really in a position to create this program for you, but I'm more than happy to offer you some advice on, you know, what you might seek in, in a program. And so we arranged a time, and I met over the telephone with the, the woman who was running, the, running this, this effort in Sacramento and a number of her colleagues, and it was, a, I think, a room up there full of about I don't know, eight or ten people, and I basically had kind of, a, kind of an academic consultation with them. And I said, well, with my background in urologic oncology and in prostate cancer, here's how I think you should structure the program. And I gave you know, a couple of hours' worth of advice, and I thought that was the end of it. Well, she, she called back um, a couple of weeks later to say, you know, we thought about this, and we really would like you to consider taking on the, the program, you know, creating this program for us, what they then called the Prostate Cancer Treatment Program, which was a non-existent program, kind of their generic name. And I thanked her very much and told her that I had, you know, other stuff going on. I was writing R01 grants and trying to get my research, you know, um, goals met to get promoted um, academically. And she said, well, well I'm going to be down in, South, in Southern California for a meeting in a couple of weeks. Would you meet me and talk to me further about it? Okay, sure. So I met her for lunch at a conference downtown, and you know, after three hours of chatting and really, really connecting in terms of the, the vision that she had for, for, for public health in this disease, I, we, I came away saying, okay, I'll do it. Um, what do I have to do? Um, and it was the best deal for $50 million I've ever gotten, the only deal that I've ever gotten, because I didn't have to write a proposal. I had to write a budget and a budget justification. So um, the first thing I did was to identify a program administrator, Laura Baybridge, who's in the audience today, who I stole from Murphy Hall, where she was sort of on the fast track to, you know, be the whatever she was on the fast track to, to be, and convinced her to come down to, to South Campus and, and work with me on this program. And we went, went ahead and began hiring people. We stole Sarah Connor away from Rand, where she had been working for a number of years, and began hiring a lot of good people. There's a very famous book on man and corporate management called Good to Great. It's a great read. Um, and one of the things that um, the author says in there is that the first rules of building a program is get the right people on the bus. Hi, Rick. He says, get, speaking of getting the right people on the, get the right, he says, get the right people on the bus before you can figure out where the bus is going. And so for $50 million, you can hire a lot of people. So we started hiring people, and we put together in a very short period of time a budget with a budget justification that involved a huge program that I'm going to tell you about, a bells and whistles kind of a program. Um, and we signed a contract with the state of California on April the 1st, 2000. And in July of 2000, uh, three months later, we enrolled our first patient. Um, and we did this, I'll tell you about how, sort of how we put this all together and how we did it so, so quickly. Um, um, so it was a $50 million demonstration project at that point um, for low-income, uninsured men with prostate cancer. And it was meant to include outreach, education, treatment, which is the principal um, expenditure of funds. And about 10% of the budget was earmarked for research, which for me was kind of the, the hook as a health services researcher. And it was meant to be a quote-unquote bells and whistles program with everything, you know, offered. Um, and so we created this program. My boss, who had walked down the hall with that letter originally, was surprised that the thing actually got off the ground. But he said to me very clearly, don't get used to that money because I guarantee he's been around a long time and these things, they're not, you know, they're not consistent. They're not stable over time. You're, it's going to, it'll dry up. So, you know, just keep your irons, you know, in other fires as, as well. So over the years, of course, the fiscal climate changed, but we have been extraordinarily fortunate in being able to keep the program running. We initially got it renewed for two years after the first three years for $11 million. Then we got it renewed again for another, another, another year while they thought about what they wanted to do. Then we got it renewed again for almost $10 million for three years. Then we got two more years of add-on for about $6 million. And this past Friday, we were notified after our second competitive uh, bid, renewal bid, that we are funded again 
from uh, from um, 2011 through June, um, uh, beginning of June 2014, for another nine, another nine million dollars. So this news is kind of hot, hot off the presses. We're sort of in the process of ne renegotiating our contract at this point, but the dollars are are there now. Fifty million dollars a year for the first three years is very different from the contract now, which is three million dollars a year. But three million dollars, you know, is three million dollars, and there's a lot that you can that you lot that you can that you can do with that. So that's where we stand right now. At the time in '01 when we signed the contract, it was the largest award, single award in the history of the University of California. And um, that, that, that probably had been surpassed, you know, by now by other, you know, other entities within the system statewide. But at the time, that, you know, that made the, the dean happy and people who look at those kind of numbers. And so the, the, the key to getting it off the ground really fast was to use the existing infrastructure of the University of California in the health systems and the, and, the, and the five health systems that are that are within the university and there are there are five medical centers in the UC system UCLA UC Davis UC San Francisco UC San Diego and you notice that one's not on here UC Irvine um, and by collaborating with the urology and radiation oncology and medical oncology departments or divisions in each of these four of these five um, UC medical centers, we were able to get the, pro the infrastructure of the program built really fast so that we could kind of reach out to all the different areas of the, uh, of the, of the state. And we divided up the state into four regions initially, uh, four active regions. Um, uh, UC San Francisco was going to take the, the light blue area, UC Davis the yellow area, uh, UC San Diego the dark blue area at the bottom, those two counties, and then UCLA was meant to take uh, most of these green counties but not all of them. UC Irvine was going to take a couple of those counties but they ultimately declined to participate for a, for a variety of, of uh, unfortunate reasons and so UCLA took the whole sort of green area. And we set up a kind of a, um, a way station at each of these places, the main one being here of course, we had uh, fully funded, fully staffed offices in, in all the other regions as well. The, the un unshaded regions up at the top of the state we did go into initially because there's there's not really anybody who lives there and um, those, those the people who do live there we were able to kind of commute them down to other areas of the state we now are in all 58 counties but this was at the very very um, beginning um, we named the program um, as you see here and you know if it, it, you've got a, it's LA right so you have to be able to brand things really well our original um, original uh, logo had these little palm trees and it's supposed to be a sunrise in the back but it kind of looks like a nuclear explosion a little bit so that's <laughs> that's been through a little bit over the years but that's basically, that's basically how we how we create there's a they're doing a premiere up here for this new movie that's coming out tonight on uh, like battle the, yeah, battle of LA so it, 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 it could be the battle of LA <laughs> in the impact of the so that's that's basically how we kind of divided up the state and we did it um, with this in mind with in my kind of perspective on public health and the delivery of healthcare services was to marry access and quality. And what I learned, have learned in my training in public health is that you want to try to optimize both, but they kind of go opposite from each other in that the, the easier you make access to care by the broadest number of providers, the more trouble you have in terms of, of maintaining quality. And then the, the, the converse is also true. If you tighten up the, the quality criteria, you end up with you know, access problems. If you know, you're only going to certify a, a given number of, of, of providers. And on that, on those, on those pillars was built the, the three things that are listed up there: treatment, education, and outreach. Sort of, you know, basic public health um, principles. Um, <clears throat> this piece of the program was was a given to us from the state of California. Um, individuals who were going to be eligible had to reside in California. Notice it doesn't say legal resident; it says California residents. And we went back and forth on this a lot. And this is actually the thing at that meeting, at the lunch, meet, the lunch meeting downtown, that kind of sort of cinched me when I was working with the woman who has long since left the state of uh, the state government about um, sort of what, what drew me in was that was that I because I asked about this. What about uh, what about undocumented um, residents? And it was basically kind of a don't ask, don't tell sort of a policy, but the very, very clear sort of undercurrent of the conversation was that she, as a public health professional, very much wanted this to be inclusive. And so she says, well, the language that came from the governor's office and from the legislature says California residents, and we're going to take it as that. She actually ran me through a couple of role-playing exercises for if I were queried by legislators. Uh, about whether they're legal or, or, or undocumented residents of California. She was very concerned about this, but she very much wanted them covered. So they had to be, have to be California residents, and these criteria remain in place today. They have to be at 200% or less of the federal poverty level, have to be uninsured. It's a small provision for the underinsured, and we can talk about that later if you want. And they had to be ineligible for Medicare or Medicaid. 
at account. Um, and these are, these are basically the only, the only givens. And so we built a program. And the program that we built um, includes all these covered services. Uh, it covers all these medical services, consultations with the, with the uh, urologist or the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, a variety of different treatments, treatment options for prostate cancer. And this is basically the state-of-the-art treatments that are, that are available anywhere for prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> um, access to clinical trials. Um, which are done at the, mostly at the universities, obviously. The various diagnostic tests, inpatient services, outpatient services. We contract with a lab company statewide that um, provides laboratory services. We contract with a pharmaceutical, with a, with a pharmacy provider um, that provides pharmaceuticals um, um, you know, across the state. And probably the most important centerpiece of the program was this nurse case management piece. Um, every single individual patient is, was and is assigned to a nurse case manager. Who is kind of kind of acts like a facilitator or a navigator for the healthcare system with regards to prostate cancer, and she or he, uh, it's all she's right now, but she she refers the patient to you know all these different services, um, and it goes everything from the obvious things that you would want if you had prostate cancer to the things that may be a little less obvious, such as dietary advice, social services. When we started the program, we had a full-time dietitian on staff. She was a, a RD, MPH, that what she had, um, and she came up with, it was a dream job for her because she came up with all these great cookbooks and recipes, you know, for different ethnic groups as to sort of help the wife prepare the meals for the husband with prostate cancer so he could do better kind of thing. Um, all the way through you know, counseling services, we have a number of mental health providers on our panel of providers that we, that we take care of, and all the way through to the end, through, through hospice services. In oncology, we don't like to speak of cradle-to-grave services, because <laughs> we don't really give the right sort of tone, but that's what the services are in cancer, because people, it's cancer and people do die from it, of course, and so we have the, sort of the whole, the whole scope there. My nurse case manager has been a godsend to me. She not only helped me with uh, the medical side of it, but she helped me psychologically. And uh, she, she, she truly seems to really care about the patients. And uh, I don't know whether I could have made it without Sarah or not, to be honest with you. One of the first things we did was to take a look at what kind of written education materials were available for men with prostate cancer whom we were serving throughout the state. Um, we did kind of like a biopsy of what, what's available, and, and, and we published this. And it, it turns out that of the, the plethora of educational materials in writing that were available for men with prostate cancer 10, you know, 10 plus years ago, um, virtually all of them were aimed at an affluent white population. Every single graphic, every single photo that was in these um, materials had a picture of some silver-haired fox-looking guy, you know, walking on the on the on the ninth green with his wife, with the little, you know, with the Tiffany thing around her neck and a sweater kind of folded over. You know, they look like they walked out of some, you know, some, you know, Brooks Brothers commercial. And that's fine for that segment of the population, but it doesn't speak to you if you're a Latino immigrant or if you're an African American or if you're a Korean American, you know, or any of the number of other um, populations that we were trying to serve. And so we put together um, kind of community-based advisory boards of individuals from different communities to help advise us on how to make our educational materials more culturally relevant, um, more literacy sensitive. You know, most of these things are written, even today, most of these things are, are written at kind of the 12th grade or college level, which is too high <clears throat> even for sort of an average sophisticated consumer. You know, when I went to the to the ophthalmologist a few years ago, because I had these little floaters in my, what they call floaters in my, in my eyes, um, they handed me this brochure that I tricked him from some drug company, and it looked like it was written at like the sixth grade level, but it, it was exactly what I felt like I needed, because it explained things to me with no underlying assumptions of any knowledge of ophthalmology. Um, and, you know, and so that's what we needed. And so we write all of our materials now at a level that's tar targeted, you know, it's, it's targeted lower, either because that's the education level of our patients or because, you know, that's, that's the most appropriate level, even if, if they're more educated than that. The nurse case management model <clears throat> then was kind of built as the centerpiece of the program. This is my kind of graphic of, of sort of how it's, uh, how it's uh, structured. Um, but I, I hired in a couple of, uh, of colleagues who were, who were nurse, you know, had backgrounds in nursing and in public health. Two people in particular, one Barbara Clerken, who was an RN MPH, who I had known from, from a prior project in the past, 
who had background in public health and in urology nursing, and another colleague, um, um, Sally Maliski, who's a nurse scientist, RN PhD, and together, along with some of the other staff, they kind of created this nurse case management um, um, kind of foundation for the program, and it's all built on patient self-empowerment. So it's not just about navigating the system, not just about how to reschedule your missed appointment because you missed the bus and couldn't get there, but also how to feel empowered to actually pick up the phone and call the doctor, right? The population that we were and are serving really have been what you would call the fall through the cracks population. You know, if, if, if my father missed a bone scan appointment because of some conflict or something, he'd be on the phone calling the doctor, calling the office to reschedule it, right? Or someone else in the family would. These are the men who, if they miss an appointment for one thing or another, they just kind of slip into the cracks. They don't call back. They're embarrassed to call back. They're embarrassed that they missed the appointment. Um, they don't feel empowered for whatever reason to actually, you know, actually pick up the phone and, and, and get back and get back in touch. And so part of it was for self-empowerment, so that long after they had finished with their prostate cancer treatment, hopefully that when they get to age, you know, 65 and they begin having their cardiac issues, that they'll be empowered to take care of themselves and take care of their own of their own health. Um, they found the radiologist, they did everything for me. They even found one in the area that I could get to. So this is an important principle as well. The patients in the program are not treated at these university hospitals. There's a tiny minority that are treated there because that's where it's convenient to go. But the patients are, by and large, not treated there. There's the, the, the infrastructure backbone goes through the, or at the time, went through the, the different sites of the University of California across the state. But that was just to get people out in the world, out into the communities, doing outreach and education, and working with different community hospitals and doctors. But by and large, um, the preponderance of the patients are treated in their own communities. They're treated at Sutter or at Altadena Bates or at, you know, whatever the hospital happens to be in San Bernardino or Brent Ventura or Riverside or, you know, wh whatever the county is that they, that they live in. If you're fortunate enough to live in a county where there is a county hospital, that makes things easier um, in terms of coordinating with the safety net. But as you probably know, of the 58 counties in California, almost all of them have no county hospital. So there's no place for them to just naturally go. And so the basic principle of public health is to treat the low-income uninsured patients in their own communities. And there's a million reasons why it's important to, to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> as we began to accumulate more and more um, educational and sort of background information, we put together a website um, to, to serve another one of the needs of the, the woman in Sacramento who, who created, you know, who, who originally contacted me to create the program, and that was to do whatever we could to push care forward, not only for those men enrolled in the program, but also for the population of California at large and perhaps the, you know, the, the larger community beyond that. And so we agreed that everything we did, and it's a publicly funded program, and so it's not a stretch, but everything we did had to be made available for, for everyone to, to see. So everything we've developed in terms of educational materials, certainly all of our research, um, videos, um, audio stuff, written material is all available, is all available on, on the website. I'm just going to show you a few screen show you a few screenshots from the website to kind of take you to a little bit of a, a tour there. Um, there's a, there's a whole section on, en on enrollment, and you notice what the graphics are, right? There's not a lot of, you know, white guys on the golf course in this, uh, uh, as part of the graphics. They're meant, it's meant to speak to the people who are interested in the program. It's also meant to speak to the people who are their advocates. One of the things we worried about early on was, well, maybe the poor um, minority patients don't use the Internet. Turns out they do use the Internet a lot. Um, and they use it even more now. And we've done, done little pilot studies to look at that. But if they don't have a Wi-Fi connection in their house, you know, they go to, they go to the public library and they, use, and they use it there. So it's a, it's a lot more accessible. What number are you talking about? Yeah. Use the internet? I would say that of our enrolled population at any given time, probably 60 or 70 percent have some form of smartphone or access to a computer that they use. And many of them have sons or daughters, you know, or kids who are more, you know, generally, generationally connected to, to the Internet than they, than they might have been. Okay. Um, this is just a, this is, a, I can get a few screenshots. This is a sample of some of the brochures. If you kind of click down here on the website, there's, there's a variety of different things that they can, that they can get. And this is just a tiny kind of sampling of the stuff that Sarah Connor has been principally in charge. She has her MPH from UCLA, principally in health education. And so it's kind of her dream job, too. At least that's what she tells me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what are the, yeah. 
just on enrollment, just how big is your enrollment, and are you facing a waitlist situation, or are you able to just take anybody who's eligible? Perfect question. And I'm gonna, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a setup for the latter half of my, of okay. my talk. Okay. The short answer is, um, at any given time, we have about 350 men enrolled historically. Total men ever treated is almost 2,000 right now. Um, total men ever served by the program, which means not just men who are enrolled, but those who are given some kind of a referral somewhere or something, is you know, in the multiples of, of that, multiples of thousands. One of the things that we did was to create brochures that were culturally sensitive, culturally relevant. And this is just kind of a sample of one of the brochures. And again, all this stuff is downloadable, and you know, people anywhere can use it. Um, this is our brochure that has got spe specifically used to do outreach. <clears throat> into African American communities throughout the state. It's got a picture of an African American guy. For starters, you'd be surprised how many people sort of don't get that when they're putting together brochures, um, color schemes, and, and that kind of thing. You know, the basic content and the language is not really any different. It's just that the, you know the silly stuff around the sides, the decorations, and you know, the who, who, what guy are you going to show? Um, this is our this is our Spanish speaking brochure. This this guy we refer to as generic Latino guy because he's a clip art guy. He's actually the same guy that you see in a lot of the Medicare documentation. <laughs> and, um, I, hope, I hope he got uh, some kind of royalties for this because he's like generic Latino guy for like, you know, millions of different uh, publications. But he, he was free. And that's supposed to, you know, represent someone that, you know, a man who's Latino who might connect with our program, you know, would, would connect with and say that that looks like me, you know, so this program is, is for me. Obviously, it's in Spanish. Um, <clears throat> big Russian population um, of, of low-income uninsured patients. This is also from Clip Art, generic Russian guy. Um, this is kind of how it's turned. <laughs> and so there's lots of different, lots of different com communities. One of the, of, of the various Asian communities that we work in, um, we learned from our community advisory board at one point that um, the colors of the brochure we were about to go to press with were the, I forget what the colors were, but they were the colors of death. Oh. And, um, and color in certain Asian communities, Asian cultures, color um, is very symbolic and very, very important. I didn't know that, right? But our community advisory board of men in that, in that culture said, no, 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 hold the presses. You can't, you can't send out a brochure on you know, health care that's got the colors that, that we associate with death. So we change the colors, right? easy fix, and little diddlies and stuff around the sides. That's an example. This is an example of just an example of one of our other things that we post in various um, unemployment offices and places like places like that. Um, <clears throat> there's also tons. Hopefully, this will work. There's also tons of um, audio stuff. We, we got we got a um, a grant from um, the Department of Justice in the state of California to take a lot of the information we had collected and put into a written form and to convert it into audio form. Hopefully this will play. <laughs> this recording is part of the IMPACT program's Prostate Cancer Patient Education Series. This series is funded by the California Department of Health Services. Controlling Pain, Part 3, Generic versus Brand Name Medicines. Before we begin, and so this is an example of, you know, just some of the stuff that's available by, available by audio link directly on the website, as well as on little, little CDs that we send out, that we can send out to patients as well. Um, this is in the members' mm -hmm. website, is it? No, no, it's, it's a public website. Yeah. Anybody can get it. You can download the, the things as well. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why I emphasize this one on, on hair loss. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, it just me right now. Um, but you can see here, there, we have in English and in Spanish, which are the two like, principal languages we've, we've focused on for obvious reasons. But there's just a, you know, a, you know, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of this kind of stuff, of these kind of things available. And yeah, it's all, yeah it's, of course, it's all for, for free. Um, and I just wanted to, oh, that's why I wanted to play, play you this one, too. What will you learn by listening to this recording? When you have chemotherapy to control your prostate cancer, you may have side effects or unwanted changes in your body. Side effects are different from person to person and may be different from one treatment to the next. Some people have no side effects. So you get the kind of tone that's in here, right? The tone is, very, is meant to be very friendly, and we have a, 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 Spanish, a primary Spanish speaker who does all the Spanish narrations as, as well, a different guy. Um, who's really great. It's a male voice, not a female voice, which is, you know, not, not accidental. And then again, this is just, you know, a listing of some of the stuff that's available on there. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of, that's kind of um, the program and sort of where we stand with, with, with the program. We can, talk about, we can talk about that afterwards. As I mentioned before, one of the draws for me as a health services researcher was to 
be able to conduct research. Um, initially funded as part of the program, today at $3 million a year, there's no research budget at all, so we do it with collaborative parallel grants. We've had funding from the Department of Defense prostate cancer program, from uh, other entities within the state government, um, the NCI, et cetera, to do kind of pa parallel research programs. And you know, this is just kind of a sampling of the, of a, of, of the various topics that we have um, that we have done research in, or have ongoing uh, ongoing re research research in. We have um, Maria Figueroa, who, who leads our, our, our telephone um, interview service. She, she's a it's a it's a it's a it's a very large group of uh, of telephone interviewers that consists of Maria and. Well, Maria, basically, <laughs> um, occasionally a summer medical student or someone um, who has has now conducted, you know, literally thousands of telephone interviews and and mailer surveys to patients, you know, with, with you know, looking at some of this stuff, quality of life, quality of care, access, that that kind of stuff. Um, all the publications are, you know, are, are on the Impact website. You can get to them um, that way. There's links to the PubMed, um, you know, copy of the PDF to download it. A lot of the stuff is published in the nursing literature, a lot in the in the urology or the oncology literature, some of the stuff in the public health literature, um, and. Um, this is just some sam some samples of some of the stuff that that we published on hospice care quality of hospice care. This one got a bit of press from the Journal of Cancer when it came out a couple of years ago. Um, um, <clears throat> Um, you, you, know, you can read for yourself what the topics are there. But this is just sort of, you know, some of the more recent publications. Um, <clears throat> I want to I want to focus on a couple of the research, and there are about 30 now publications that we have. <clears throat> um, but I want to focus on just a couple of, of sort of interesting ones, and I just have uh, two, th uh, three that I picked to, to focus on. This is a, a, a paper that was uh, that was led by Dave Miller, a former fellow of mine, who's now on the faculty at the University of Michigan. Um, and he, he and, and one of my other colleagues here, Bill Aronson, who runs urology at all of you, had an observation, um, kind of informal observation, that although men in the more affluent and entitled populations, insured populations, have been seeing in recent years as kind of a, a, a downgrading of the severity of the prostate cancer that they are diagnosed with, probably partly because of PSA screening. Um, Men in the impact program were just had just as nasty a case, just as aggressive and severe as they've ever had in the past, and we you know wondered if this were were, were actually true or if this was just an anecdotal um, observation. And we, I mean, for all you read in the paper about how prostate cancer shouldn't be screened for and it's really an indolent disease, and I don't want to get into a discussion of whether PSA screening is a good idea or a bad idea because there's you know good arguments on on both sides. Um, the men in this program are the guys who have tumor that's metastatic to their, we have a guy metastatic to his eyeball. I mean, they're just really, really awful cases of prostate cancer. So we wanted to try and document that. And I just picked out like, a couple of key slides, but this is kind of his main um, data slide, um, which looks at, you know, um, we grade prostate cancers as higher intermediate risk, the really severe ones. And this is just something that shows the difference, you know, um, historically of the men that we've enrolled in our program over the years. They're really different from those who are published in the in other community settings who tend to have, who have tended to have, to enjoy better, better cases of prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> same thing with those who are metastatic when diagnosed. It's almost unheard of now in the insured affluent population, but we still see it all the time in impact patients because probably they don't you know, get to the care fast enough. Um, all my research uh, fellows have to do work that's got some kind of policy implications, and you, know, you can see just what, what, a couple of ours, what a couple of ours are here. I won't insult you by reading it out loud, but I'll give you a moment to read it yourself. <laughs> Another um, one of the papers that I think is really key, which was done by Jennifer Anger, who's in the audience when she was a fellow um, with me, was published in the journal Public Health Reports. Um, <clears throat> and we, we chose kind of a provocative title for this. Um, <clears throat> this gets back to your question about, about wait lists. Um, through the various budget cycles in, in Sacramento over the last um, 10 years, <laughs> Excuse me. There have been, you know, good years and bad years, and I, I logged more miles on Southwest Airlines from Burbank to Sacramento to testify before, you know, you know, Assembly, Health, and Senate Budget Committees than I, you know, than I care to. It's really not enjoyable to be up as a public health-minded person to be up there in line behind the breast cancer lobby and the ADAP people mm -hmm. and the, you know, the people, the, the people who are advocating for the disabled, and sort of every disease has their lobby up there, and I'm up there lobbying for the prostate cancer. Patients, and it's not—it's not a pleasant process, but <clears throat> that's the intersection of policy and politics. Um, but something happened in the in in um, 
about, about, uh, about this time of year, six years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there was a deepening, but one of many deepening budget crises. And without a call on Valentine's Day, 19, uh, 2005, to say, we want you to cease enrollment because we're not sure we're going to be able to continue the program. Wow. So when should I cease enrollment? Now. Okay. And so um, <coughs> I said, all right, well, how about we continue doing eligibility screens and at least establish a wait list so that if and when the program is reinstituted, we can have a, a, you know, a, a, a pool of men to enroll from so at least we don't just turn them away. And they said, absolutely, positively not, no wait list. Because if you establish a wait list, that implies some kind of commitment from the state. So I started a wait list. <laughs> and we, we used that to great effect uh, in terms of going head to head with then Governor Schwarzenegger in whether to keep the program or, or, or not. And I, I had a, a fairly public kind of, uh, you know, with, with the governor's office that played out in the Sacramento Bee um, around, around that time where we talked about the, at that time, I forget how many dozen men on the wait list. Um, for whom he was effectively issuing death warrants. They loved that kind of you know, talk <laughs> in the newspapers. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else has ever be beaten him at his game. <laughs> and maybe he just got disinterested, uninterested and went on to other things. But we got renewed. Um, but we took this, Jennifer, which was a fellow, took this as a, as a research opportunity to study the kind of natural experiment, right? Obviously, you would never r randomize men to enroll or not enroll in the program. But we took advantage of this, this temporary suspension. And we looked at outcomes, and are they any different? Nine months delay in enrollment is a really, really short amount of time to be able to see any you know, significant differences in outcomes. Um, but we found some. Jennifer found some. So case control methodology, um, 83 was the number of waitlisted men. We matched those with contemporary men who were enrolled around that time. You know, we, we, we looked at a, a variety of different measures that we were, that we were collecting in patients at the time. We ran a rapid, a rapid our Sarah actually was able to get rapid IRB approval um, to study these men who were on the wait list. And you may think the word rapid IRB approval is kind of a conflict in terms, <laughs> which it is, but, but they like chocolate down there, too, at the IRB. <laughs> we, we, know that, um, we got approval. And I just have a couple of, a couple of, uh, of slides. These are SF-12 SF scores um, here. And, you know, these are not trivial differences with just a nine-month delay. Um, and, you know, you can pull the paper and look at it, you know, more closely if you want to kind of pour through the, the data itself. But not trivial, not trivial differences in the waitlisted men for nine months versus those who were enrolled. And then these are the more striking differences because we ask questions about access to care. These really are the guys who have nowhere else to go. And you can see, you know, what the differences are in terms of what, what, what kind of services that they were able to access during those nine months of the wait list versus those who were enrolled right away. The policy levers then, um, <clears throat> you can see here, is that, you know, basically in almost all the outcomes we looked at, um, the men who were waitlisted were at least a little worse or more significantly worse, you know, up to, you know, half a standard deviation or a full standard deviation of the variance in these various outcomes that, that we looked at, okay? The policy levers and what we tried to kind of um, put out in the discussion section of the paper uh, were that principally that um, public assistance programs do actually appear to make a difference, but they've got to be done consistently over time. And it's just, it's just it's too difficult to have them be, you know, a slave to the, the machinations of the budget cycle every year. And I don't know whether that's a soluble problem, but that was the observation. And the last paper I want to highlight so we have some time for questions <clears throat> was an access to care study. Um, and this was um, also done by Dave Miller, my former fellow. We were able to rope in Lillian Gelberg and Ron Anderson, who are two kind of the international gurus in access to care. Um, see, given this, um, given this sort of equal opportunity program, are there disparities in access to care um, that we could identify? Um, <clears throat> this is Ron Anderson's access to care model kind of across the top there. If you have an MPH or you studied at UCLA, you'll recognize this, this model. Predisposing factors, enabling factors, need factors. And then on the right two boxes, you have the actual you know, measures of access. Are men actually utilizing health services? Are they realizing the care? And then what are the outcomes? And so we took, and in the, in the, across the bottom there are examples of metrics that we actually collect that might reflect each of these sort of boxes that's listed above it. And again, you can, you know, you can, the, this is a diagram from the paper itself. Um, it's on the IMPACT website. But our question was, um, you know, are, are we making a difference, basically, in terms of access to care? Um, 357 men enrolled early on in the program. 
we looked at determinants of access, we looked at outcomes, the endpoints of access that we chose to look at were not, number one, avoiding emergency room use, and two, getting regular PSA testing. So this is PSA testing that's not screening, not the controversial PSA testing. This is PSA testing that ought to be done for men who have prostate cancer. No arguments from anybody about, about that. So it's, it's, it's an access issue and it's an, an outcomes issue. Okay, so those are the two, the two endpoints that we looked at in the Anderson access model. The avoiding non-emergent ER use is particularly important. It's been used in a number of other diseases um, in that if you have navigators or healthcare facilitators, obviously part of their goal is to keep men out of the ER because that's where care is more expensive. On the other hand, if you have a heart attack, and you need to go to the ER, you should go to the ER. Um, but if you don't need it, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use it. <clears throat> um, and I just, I just sort of, I, I, I took the liberty of just kind of cherry picking some of the, you know, significant odds ratios here. And again, you can, you can, I'm not going to pour over this too long, but you can look at the paper if it's of, of interest to you. And you can see what some of the differences are, some of the significant odds ratios are that we found. All the ones that I have um, listed here are ones that were, that were significant. And so there are various factors that actually do tend to, um, to impact access. And this is with the baseline um, sort of structural issue that everyone has financial access to the care because they're in the program. These are all men in the program. And yet you still see racial ethnic differences. You see differences based on modifiable risk factors like alcohol use, um, travel distance, um, uh, a severity of illness, comorbidity, etc. Um, the policy implications here that Jennifer reported, as you, as you can read, is that even in an equal access program, quote unquote, you still have some inequities and disparities that are, that are seen. What, what I've been taking advantage of is, 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 is their expertise in, 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 in the nutrition aspect of things and the psychological aspect of things. So I've had some, not problems necessarily, but I'm sure everyone goes through some emotional Impressions at that time when they had the, the surgery, and, and, and I probably and they're probably all emotional, but not, probably not physical. And so by the time I finish talking there, I kind of feel more relieved about some of these anxieties and things that I've been having. So they, they've been very helpful in keeping me afloat. Early on in the program, we had three brothers, both with prostate cancer at the same time. One was enrolled in Impact, one had private health care, and one had a managed care. Um, um, Kaiser type coverage in Northern California and the three would compare notes and I don't have to tell you who, who which brother felt that he got the best quality I would love to have a would you love to have a navigator to help you, you know, through the healthcare system? You know, even even as someone who's you know should be more you know better able to navigate it himself, um, I would love that. And and one of the biggest, you know, I thought for me when I started this program that the that the, the payoff would be publications and helping people and just kind of doing good in the world. But what I found was that by far the most gratifying part was the, 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 the direct, and this is true for a lot of people in clinical medicine, but the most gratifying part was the direct feedback from patients that we would get either to, to me as a program director or to the doctors that we work with or very often to the nurse case managers. Um, that they, they come in. Very early on, I operated on a man in the program who was, you know, a typical hardship case, would never have been able to get care elsewhere, um, and I, you know, took his prostate cancer out, and I don't know where he got it or if it was legal or not, but he brought me a watch as a present, and he had had, he had, had it was probably some knockoff from the street, but he had had engraved a Rolex, a, you know, quote-unquote Rolex watch, you know, which I would, like, never wear as I drive my Prius, but um, on, on, on the back of it, he had had engraved that he bought me a watch, um, he said, thanks for all the extra time you've given me. And uh -huh. you, can, you can't, you can't, there is no reimbursement that, that exceeds that for a physician um, than something like that. I think it's the greatest program in the world. I honestly believe it saved my life. Thank you very much. <laughs>